I think we're at a turning of the tide. I think the secular atheistic project has kind of run its course in the West. It's done a lot of damage, but I think people are now starting to realize that it's run out of steam and it can't provide the kind of story that people need to live their lives by. And if it can happen to Ayan Hirsi Ali, I feel like it could happen to anyone. She was the most famous female atheist in the world, easily. And, and yet here she was several years later saying, actually, I've come to completely rethink my attachment to atheism. It isn't working, essentially. And obviously had gone on this personal spiritual quest and had found that actually she was going to give Christianity a try. She was going to give it a second look. And from what I've seen and heard, it's completely changed her life. I suppose I would just simply want to, to encourage people to say, well, what if we've got the story wrong? What if actually that view of scientific materialism is itself an unwarranted assumption about the world? What if actually there is more in heaven and earth than can be contained in your philosophy? What if actually, if there were to be a resurrection, Jesus perhaps was the supreme candidate for whom it might happen? My conversation today is with Justin Briley. It's recorded in London. Uh, he's an English academic, writer, podcaster, Christian apologist, who's been doing some really interesting work in the big changes that are at play at the moment in our culture. There has been a massive, almost revolution uh, in the West in recent years. I think everyone knows that. They're all talking about it. Uh, some thinkers uh, are saying that we're almost at the point where we have to say we're at a civilizational moment. And it's important that we explore this. So this show is dedicated, this conversation is dedicated to good and earnest people everywhere, anywhere they might be, who are genuinely trying to make sense of a very confusing world, particularly one where leading thinkers are in many ways rethinking their own position. Justin, thank you so much for your time today. It's delightful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you've written this book, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, Why New Atheism Grew Old and Secular Thinkers Are Considering Christianity Again. Now, that's going to evoke all sorts of responses and anyone who goes on YouTube and looks at some of the conversations you've had will see that. Mm. But these are important conversations. Can you tell us in your words why you wrote this and how it's playing out? So I began hosting conversations between atheists and Christians around the time that the new atheism started gaining head of, uh, of steam. And, and that was really the time that these anti-God books by Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris were being written. Uh, the God Delusion probably being the best known of them, selling over two million copies worldwide. And it was a time when being an atheist was very trendy. It was very cool. Um, it was seemed very countercultural. It was coming in the wake of 9-11 and all the concerns around fundamentalist religion and so on. And so there was this very strong, dogmatic, anti-religious sentiment in the public square. A lot of column inches devoted to trashing religion, um, saying why Christianity, Islam, everything was bad for us. And in a sense, also saying God didn't make sense. It was all fairy tales. We need science, reason and so on. So I started hosting shows where we debated these issues, bringing on Christian thinkers opposite some of these atheist voices. And that was, uh, you know, a very combative, interesting, pugnacious time to be hosting these conversations. Um, but what I noticed is that in the course of hosting these conversations, things began to change over the, a decade, a decade and a half. And eventually I found a lot more of the non-believers coming on the show were actually saying, well, I'm not a Richard Dawkins kind of atheist. They were starting to distance themselves from this quite, if you like, almost fundamentalist form of atheism itself. I think, I think the new atheism took on a certain quasi-religious flavor itself in, in terms of how stringent it was, how dogmatic it was. It had its own sort of uh, creed, if you like, a naturalist, materialist creed. And it had its own outgroup, you know, heretics, people who questioned the, the, the orthodoxy and so on. So there were a lot of things going on at the time, and I was sort of an interested bystander. And over time, I also saw that the atheist movement itself start to splinter internally. Uh, there were a lot of internal fights that started to occur, and it was really because the culture wars kind of came early, the new atheism. And they started to fight over some of the social justice issues, which we now hear so much about. 
Um, but at the time, it really split the movement. So you had essentially Richard Dawkins on the sort of what would you now call anti-woke side of this. And you had others who wanted to go in a very socially justice oriented direction. And the, the arguments and debates that played out between the new atheists were far worse than any they had with their Christian counterparts. So this ended up with some of the key proponents not being willing to share a stage anymore. Atheist conferences being cancelled. You had Richard Dawkins being stripped of his Humanist of the Year award because of his um, views on transgender and so on. So it was, it was just fascinating to see the way the movement itself started to, to implode at one level. And then to see alongside that, the rise of interesting figures who were, if you like, drawing an audience that had once turned up for Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens. But these were people like Jordan Peterson, who were saying, well, maybe we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe religion isn't so bad for us. Maybe we, we, there's actually a lot to learn from the Bible. And, and so I, I started to track some of these interesting secular intellectuals, but who were far more open and gracious and interested in Christianity. And I started to bump into more of them, people like the historian Tom Holland um, and his book Dominion. And I started to engage some of these on my shows. And, and very often they were there to sort of, in their own way, represent the value of Christian faith against some of these atheist interlocutors. So it was a really interesting moment. And I, I just sensed that something was changing. So one particular conversation catalyzed for me the book, if you like. And, and that was when I had Douglas Murray on, who's quite a well-known conservative thinker here in the UK. And oh, he, not just in the UK. Yeah, well, all over the world, really. Yeah. Um, associate editor of The Spectator. And, and he, I brought him on for a conversation with um, the New Testament historian N.T. Wright. And, and they were talking about sort of living in a post-Christian society. And one of the things Douglas Murray said, he referenced that well-worn line from Matthew Arnold's poem, Dover Beach. The, that talks about the melancholy, long withdrawing roar mm. of the sea of faith, which obviously written 150 years ago, that sort of secularization and scientism and, and so on that he saw happening in his age has only continued to accelerate to ours. But he said, the interesting thing, Justin, is the sea of faith doesn't only go out, it could come back in again. That's the point of tides. And he was saying this in the context of seeing a number of his secular peers who had converted to Christianity. And he was quite surprised to see these thinking, intelligent 21st century people who had embraced Christian faith. And he said, maybe this is a moment when the tide is turning. And that's really the metaphor that I kind of use throughout this book. I think we're at a turning of the tide. I think the secular atheistic project has kind of run its course in the West. It's done a lot of damage. But I think people are now starting to realise that it's run out of steam and it can't provide the kind of story that people need to live their lives by. I'd like to pick that point up mm. because isn't the reality that they set out in many ways, I don't think there's anything terribly new about the new atheists. I remember as a university student looking at the surge of, in, of atheist thinking that followed the publication of the, um, uh, the theory of evolution in what, uh, 1859. Mm. Uh, and to me, there didn't look to be a lot of difference. But they were promising a new and better way to live. That was the part of mm. let's break free of yeah. what happened uh, on 9 11. That was evil. Religion's evil. We'll offer you a better way. But they weren't able, mm. and this is really germane mm. to this conversation, to come up with a formula as to how then we might live. Mm. Mm. I've not been able to do it. Yeah, I'd agree. As you say, I don't think the new atheists had any particularly new arguments against mm. religion, against God, but they did have a very media savvy approach to it. So you had things like the atheist bus campaign in, in London. This was these red London buses yeah. circulating the capital, bearing the slogan, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. But it, it, it was fairly empty in terms of actual content because once they'd agreed that religion was bad for you and God didn't exist, they, they didn't have a lot else to offer mm. um, because science and reason is great for some things, but I don't think you can build a meaningful life out of it. And so. I noticed that, that in a sense, once, once they'd kind of had that, that, that initial push after 9-11 and they'd kind of done this critique of religion, what they actually offered in place of religion really didn't take, take hold. There, there was this, I think, naive utopian idea that there'd be a, a, a golden age of science and reason would, would somehow come to dominate. And that simply didn't appear. In fact, it went in the opposite direction. I think the new atheists in the end have been quite shocked to see rather than clearing the stage once they'd got rid of Christianity for, for, for this utopian scientific future, 
it led in all the other kinds of quasi-religious stories. Dawkins has, has, has owned that problem. I yeah, think. absolutely. And, and Richard Dawkins. And, and you've had people like Ayan Hirsi Ali also pointing this out and many others besides. And so this is something I really pick up on in the book is that I think we always, people need a story to live by. We're, in that sense, we're sort of intrinsically religious. And you can kind of, if you, if you sort of push institutional religion or the Christian story out of the frame, some other religious story will come in to fill the void. It's not going to be this atheist material story of reality because that's not a story. It, does, it doesn't, just doesn't actually get to people's soul. And for me, that's why we've seen the rise of all other kinds of stories. Um, it could be other religious stories, um, but it's, it's also some of the, the progressive left ideologies around sexuality and gender. They've kind of become the new sacred story for many people, the, the thing that kind of is Environmentalism their too. Yeah. Or not, and of, we're all in favour of sound environmentalism and good stewardship, but it can become a yeah, religion. Uh, it, Mother Earth, Gaia, and Gaia is offended because we humans have overbred and overconsumed and the only redemption is you know, self-flagellation and even reduction in our numbers. Yeah, and, and the, the interesting thing about some of these movements is, is that they, they actually contain a lot of the typical markers of, of religious practice. You know, th mm. There's a lot of uh, rituals involved mm. of various kinds. Um, there are these high priests, very often of the movement, mm. sacred texts that shouldn't be questioned. And there's um, and there's there's a lot of and the cancel culture that often attends some of some of this activism I think is is a kind of modern day heresy hunting effectively that you might have seen in you know dogmatic religion of the past so so there's a lot of ways in which I think people unwittingly are actually effectively embracing new forms of religion even if they don't think of themselves as as religious and as I say I think it's because we do need that story to live by and so if you haven't got something like the Christian story which for generations gave people, whether they realised it or not, a sort of common sense of purpose and identity. And, and as many people have pointed out, really laid the foundations for Western civilization. As that has gone into the back mirror, I think people have naturally just tried to replace it with something else. The problem, of course, is that all the stories we're now replacing it with are often uh, bumping up against each other. And, and that's where the culture wars come from. And not producing a lot of sort of deep center seated satisfaction and mm. purpose. And I, re I remember that, um, the big thing on the buses. I was asked about it in yeah. Australia. Uh, you know, God, uh, Colin, he's probably not there. Yeah. So relax and go and enjoy yourself. Yeah, stop worrying and enjoy your life was the, the catchphrase. Two things struck me as extraordinary about that. And I made the point at the time when I was asked about it. Firstly, if the atheists are not confident enough to say he's not there, <laughs> <laughs> they can only say he's probably not mm. there. It'd be wise just to think through carefully for yourself whether you believe them or not. If there's a possibility, mm. there might be a lot at stake. Mm. The second thing that struck me, though, was that we've been behaving as though he's not there and we're not enjoying ourselves. Yeah. We're not happy. Yeah. Every indicator tells you that we're not. Now, I don't say that some sense of triumphalism, ah, oh, the new atheists were wrong, just the opposite. Mm. You know, I, I grieve for the number of people who feel a lack of purpose and a lack of direction and a lack of value. Yeah. So let me throw you a, a curved ball. What would your Christian version be of an appropriate billboard or uh, label for the side of the bus? What is the gospel? What should people really be considering? Um, I, I think it would be something like... Um, you, you weren't made to do this alone by yourself. Um, because I think that's, that's the message people have received today. It's that I have to invent myself from scratch. That's the kind of the drumbeat of a lot of modern culture, self-invention. And I just think that's an intolerable burden for most people. And the, for me, the, the heart of the Christian gospel is that we haven't been left to work it out for ourselves. God has stepped in to human history and said, I can help you, <laughs> and it's in the form of Jesus Christ, uh, because we cannot save ourselves. The more technology, science, wealth, whatever we throw into the mix, it turns out we make ourselves more and more unhappy. And, and so for me, it would be something like, you weren't meant to do this alone. Um, there's a God who, who came to, to die for you, to be with you, to give you a new start. So it's, it's kind of, 
the Christian message, in a sense, really hasn't changed in 2000 years. I just think that the ways in which people access it and the problems that we create for ourselves sort of just tend to, to change and evolve, but it's still the same solution in the end. It's a massive change, though, for an age to take on board what you mm. just said. When the culture has said, you are your own God, mm. you can determine everything about yourself. You own your body, you own your life, you own everything. It's actually a very selfish doctrine. It's mm. not a very satisfying one, but it's very radical to say that you're not actually up to the task of being your own God, because in essence, that's what you're addressing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's the problem is that we create for ourselves lots of little gods um, in, in our culture. I mean, was it Calvin who said the human heart is a perpetual idol making factory and, and that has not changed. We, we constantly create idols in our lives, things that effectively take the place of God. And even the new atheism itself was, was as I said, a sort of quasi religious idol for many people. Science can become an idol. Environmentalism can become an idol. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with, with science or, or with you know, looking after the environment. But when it becomes the focus, when it takes the place of God, then suddenly it can become very destructive, actually, it, 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 because it's not being put in its proper orbit around God at the center. And for me, that's, that, that's, I think, what people are just starting to cotton on to, that actually in this very individualistic, consumerist age, we, we cannot do this by ourselves. The more we, as I say, put in science, technology, um, uh, prosperity, it turns out we make ourselves more unhappy. We're, we're addicted to social media. Smartphones are making our children su feel suicidal. There's, there's a kind of sense in which we can't save ourselves. And, and I just even sense that some of the new atheists are starting to wake up to that and starting to realize actually we can't do this by ourselves. There's a reassuring message in that, I think, for people who are struggling themselves. If these great thinkers are reassessing, it's perfectly respectable for me to go on that similar journey. Uh, and that's what I think, you know, presumably in many ways motivated you to write the book, to say to, say to people, look, mm. um, this is a very respectable thing to do, mm. to re-engage in this debate. Well, well, I think it is. And, and that's sort of the change in the tone of the conversation mm. that I've seen. And a lot of these secular thinkers, it's hard to pin down where they are on the faith spectrum. But what they have done, I think, is they've, they've made looking into Christianity an intellectual option again mm. for people. So... You know, a lot of people have tried to, to guess exactly where Jordan Peterson is when mm. it comes to God and Christianity, and, and who knows. But what I do know is he's opened the door exactly. for a lot of his audience yeah. to take it yeah. seriously. Yeah. And I know many people, especially a lot of young men, who are now Christians mm. because Jordan Peterson kind of gave them permission <laughs> to read the Bible yeah. and not to just dismiss it out of mm. hand as Sam Harris and, and Dawkins and so. Anecdotally, done. I'm seeing exactly the same thing. Yeah. And even this podcast series, has produced a, a surprising number of younger people, particularly the young men who in our English, Australian, American type culture are regularly described as toxic simply because they're mm. male. Mm. And they're saying, hey, no, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, I'm feeling very isolated. Uh, this is a pretty harsh judgment. And they're rethinking. Yeah. And I think- I'm gonna say, uh, some of them are really impressive. Yeah. They're yeah. people who can yeah, shape yeah. the world. Yeah. And I think there's, I mean, this, all of this links into, I think there's a kind of male identity crisis in our culture. And I think Jordan Peterson, the, one of the reasons he became so immensely popular overnight was he kind of provided a sort of father figure who was compassionate actually for, for where a lot of these young men find themselves kind of com very confused, lots of contradictory messages in the culture coming their way, but kind of suddenly saying, well, there is a roadmap, you know, there is this way of living that has been around for millennia and maybe it's time to take a second look at it and suddenly it, it, it is remarkable how quickly I think the conversation changed from these young men essentially being drawn to this sort of you can be your own sort of god that the new atheists essentially were, were saying by, by kind of taking control to kind of actually saying no you you need something more than yourself and and I, I would say I've seen that not just from the Jordan Peterson effect, lots of lots of interesting thinkers who are suddenly giving people intellectual permission mm. to take Christianity seriously again. Um, I mentioned Tom Holland earlier, who's well known British historian. And again, it, such a refreshing voice when he suddenly came out with his book Dominion and making just from a secular historical case, mm. the way that the case for Christianity being 
the bedrock of our moral imagination in the West and, and kind of, you know, getting into a lot of spats with his secular brethren because of it. But I think his case has absolutely been vindicated now because so many of the new atheists, I think, are, are kind of now coming to realise that we, we didn't get Western culture in a vacuum. It, and it certainly didn't come from enlightenment or scientific thinking. It, it came from the Christian revolution. And if you like, as Tom Holland makes the case, the enlightenment and science and everything were, were ripples really of that further down the stream. So that's a confronting thing yeah, for a lot of people it to is, hear. It is, yeah. You know, and very different to the, yeah. the narrative that they had been hearing, yeah. you know, throughout the sort of mid 2000s and mid 2010s. You never heard that never cut through. There were people saying, I mean, Tom Holland's not the first person to say this, mm. but suddenly his thesis seemed to cut through. And I think it was because people were no longer quite so ready to listen to or believe the sort of the new atheist version of reality. Well, including many of the leaders of the new atheist movement. Into, Surely exa that's part exactly. of the point. And, and Here I, are these yeah, leading thinkers yeah. mm. who have taken us on a journey. I hope some of them actually are humble enough to stop and say, we might have actually inflicted quite a bit of damage on other people. Yeah, I, I think there are people saying that. And so the obvious example is Ayan Hirsi Ali, who Obviously, just after my book was published, her story came out of having said, actually, I now call myself a Christian. And you could have knocked me over with a feather, John, when I saw that. I was like, this is, it's kind of in the atheist Christian world. This is like the, the, the road to Damascus Paul moment because she was mm. the most famous female atheist in the world, easily. What arguably could have been the fifth horse, horseman of the atheist, new atheist apocalypse. And, and yet here she was several years later saying, actually, I've come to completely rethink my attachment to atheism. Do, it, it isn't working, essentially. And obviously had gone on this personal spiritual quest and had found that actually she was going to give Christianity a try. She was going to give it a second look. And from what I've seen and heard, it's, it's completely changed her life. And, and if it can happen to Ion Hersey Alley, I feel like it could happen to anyone at this point. There's something going on, which means that that people are being given permission to think differently. And, and it's extraordinary even to hear someone who's still obviously an atheist like Richard Dawkins talking so very differently, though, very different, mm. sort of saying, yeah, I'm on Team Christian. I mean, when when did you ever hear him saying that? In well, he used to so call people. Thing? He did this once. I'm sure he wouldn't do it again. But I, I know a fellow who lives in Australia now who disagreed with him on television and Richard Dawkins dismissed him as a flea. Yeah. Yeah. So he took upon himself the name We Flee, I'm the We Flee. I, I know the person you're talking <laughs> about. A bit of a sense yeah. of humour. Yeah. Uh, I have the, the enormous honour of sitting beside Ayan Hirsi Ali. I'd known her for quite mm. some years before that uh, at the ARC conference last mm. year, which I think might have been the first time she'd actually spilt out. I think it was. That movement. Uh, and, and that can be found, uh, of course, in the ARC recordings. Mm. Um, her case is a very interesting one. Incidentally, she wrote the a book which more than any other books helped me understand Islam mm. and the training of young people that it provides. Mm. And she sets it all out in Infidel. Yeah. Um, why Islam needs a reformation now, uh, which must be 10 years ago. So it was it, like the Richard Dawkins books, it was mm. everywhere mm. in the airport. Mm. The, it's all, that's the big test, isn't it? You go through an airport and all the bookshelves are loaded. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is a great change. But uh, there's an aspect of this... Uh, that you might be able to uh, draw out, because I know you've spoken to her. And this is probably a common experience. It's almost as though it was a great shock. She stumbled over this. It was nothing like what she mm. expected it to be. It was mm. a great revelation. Mm. So although she, in a way, moved away from her cultural background physically and mentally and spiritually and so forth very decisively and immersed herself in Western culture, when she actually discovered what underpinned Western culture, it mm. came as a shock to her. Yeah. That tells you a lot about our yeah. culture, doesn't it? it? It does, doesn't it? And and again, I think one of the the best evangelists in the UK at the moment is Tom Holland, the historian, because I think it was his thesis that sort of was very integral in persuading Ion that actually, yeah, the foundations of the West do essentially mm. rest on the Judeo-Christian heritage. And 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 so I think that the intellect intellectual shift had been happening for some time. But I think there was also, as I say, this. she's spoken very freely about this kind of spiritual quest that she went on. And I, I was very moved to hear her talk about this moment when she was in therapy and just 
couldn't really find a reason for living. Uh, she, you know, tried all the other routes. She tried the science route. She tried, you know, she was drinking a lot, and and she just said, finally, this therapist said, "Well, have you tried praying?" And she said, "Well, I can't believe in God. The God I was raised with was a, a monster." And this therapist said, "Well, what kind of God do you think you could believe in?" And as she started to describe that God, she says, "I realized I was basically describing Jesus Christ." And so she thought, "Well." Let's try this God, you know, and she started going to church. Mm. And firstly, that's an incredibly humble thing to do. That that, that I, I have so much respect for someone who, if you like, has come from where she has been as, as one of these figures of the new atheism to say, I'm going to try something different because I'm I've kind of reached my the end of myself at this point. And uh, and then I think you're right. I think she was very surprised to find that the Christianity she encountered, the, the Christ she encountered, was not the one she had been sort of told about. Um, and and that I think, that I'm very grateful for because those are the kinds of people we need in our culture to kind of, these are prophets, if you like, from outside the church. Yeah. And that often they are far more able to persuade and encourage people than people like me, who essentially, you know, people from within the church. And I, I'm very glad that we've got people, whether they call themselves Christian or not, who are, if you like, not coming necessarily from a Christian place, but simply saying, I've looked at this from the outside and it turns out this might have a story that, that helps us, that, that, that makes sense of things. And, and I think Ian's a great example of one of those. Well, I certainly, amongst other things, salute her courage. Mm. Uh, we live in an age that desperately needs leadership. And you have to be enormously courageous to even offer to serve as a leader. And I choose those words quite carefully mm. in our culture, given its malaise at the moment. Uh, so good on her. Uh, aren't we fortunate to have her, having come in, as you said, from outside and able to mm. shine a bright light uh, on some of the things that need to be grappled with? I suspect many people see how serious things are. They tell me that all the time, anecdotally. Mm. I, know, I don't mean many people. I do meet them occasionally. You say, oh, everything's going well. Mm. We're on a good trajectory. Mm. Mm. They usually tend to be extraordinarily privileged people who are insulated, yeah. isolated, can afford luxury beliefs, we can mm. put it that way. Mm. But generally speaking, people are very, very concerned. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the external threats, geopolitical, the internal threats, our self-loathing. It's one thing to see the problems. It's another thing in an age like this when... Most people have no idea at all, Justin, of what Christianity really is for them to consider its claims and to think that perhaps that's where the answers lie. How do they go about that in this age? How, how do you encourage people? With, most people wouldn't know a church. Yeah. They wouldn't know mm. a minister. Mm. There are many people who don't even know a believer. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it said we live in a post-Christian age. I think we're even moving beyond post-Christian because at this point there is almost, among many young people especially, almost zero awareness of the mm. Christian story, let alone any biblical knowledge. Um, so you really are starting from scratch with, with in a lot of cases. Uh, I think I think that's both a challenge and an opportunity yeah. because in some ways one of the things I've noticed in a slightly older generation is that they think they do know the Christian story and possibly Ayan thought she knew the Christian story, but actually they've been essentially sold a, a kind of, uh, yeah, a, a version of it that, that isn't actually mm -hmm. what it is. And, and so they've kind of been inoculated against it. They've been given enough of it in a sort of cultural nominal way to think they know what it is and they've, they've rejected it. But actually I think we're now at a, a, an opportunity in a sense with the fact that we really don't have any purchase in, in our culture among many people, for there not to be any baggage either. They, they're not, people aren't necessarily kind of, have, haven't necessarily been turned off church because they've never been into church yeah. in the first place. So I think, I think in that sense, there is an opportunity there to sort of start again and to say, okay, what do we do? What I think we are seeing with a number of these thinkers is people are recognizing, well, what we've got isn't working. And so we need something else. We need a better story to make sense of the world. And, and that's why I think the Christian story is still there and ready to kind of bubble up again. Um, I was very struck during the, um, the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II and when her body was lying in state and you had these mourners, you know, stretching for miles down the Thames coming to pay respects. 
even in our very post-Christian culture, it was interesting to see the way that spirituality sort of bubbled up for people. They wanted to do something to mark this as a meaningful moment. And as you saw the people stop as they did opposite the, the, the coffin and, and, and pay their respects, very often it was some kind of a, a crossing or, a, mm. or hands together. There's a sense in which we, we want things to be meaningful. We, 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 there's something deep in us where we're looking for something. And, and I think the Christian story is still there, ready to give people the means to make mm. sense of the story they're living in. Mm. Um, I think we're actually potentially seeing more openness, actually, especially among Gen Z, the youngest generation. I think that's right. I, yeah, I think there's anecdotal evidence. Yeah. I think there's even some real, um, you know, researched evidence mm. now mm. to suggest that the drift away has stopped and may yeah. even be slowly reversing. Mm. Mm. And those people, of course, those younger people are deeply conscious that things are a mess and oh, they've not been yeah. given yeah. a rational yeah. framework through or lens through which they can understand the world. They get that, I think. Absolutely. And now, I'm not saying that Christianity will be the obvious thing that sweeps in. Um, there's lots of other options on the table. I mean, you, you go on TikTok and things like witch talk are, are popular you know there's all these kinds of new age and sort of esoteric beliefs but the point is people are not kind of going off in this scientific atheistic direction they're they're they're, they're very open to spirituality and the question is can christians tell their story compellingly in our culture and show that actually all these other stories be they the sort of political ideologies or the activist ideologies or the the, the, the new age spiritualities, they're not, they're not enough. They don't, mm. they don't actually get to the heart of who we are. And my, my suspicion is actually, this is an amazing moment for the church, if it can get its act together. And it's kind of, the door's been opened by some of these secular intellectuals. Mm. They've shown that actually there's a lot of people who are just waiting to be told a better story. And I just wish that sometimes we would do a, a bit of a better job at actually taking a lead from those people who, who you know, I mean, what, what pastor wouldn't love to have 2,000 young men turn up at their church for a three-hour lecture on the Bible, yet Jordan Peterson seems to manage it. What's going on? Why? Why? What's happening there? And, and I'm not saying that he holds all the answers, but at the same time, we need to, to listen, be willing to listen and learn why, why that, what's, what is the, the, the itch that he's scratching, you know? Well, some of those hard issues should be addressed, and sometimes we haven't been very good at it. So there will be people listening now who will think, well, that's all very well. Perhaps like uh, you talk to Alex O'Connor. I don't mm. know him. He's plainly a very, very bright person. I think he's serving a great role in asking the hard questions and challenging us to answer some of them. Mm. Uh, now, he suggested, and, and I've, I've heard him do this, I think, in a conversation with you, that many who have come to the point of saying, well, yeah, it is true, we shouldn't jettison Christianity as the basis of our culture. But that doesn't mean that we should necessarily believe or many of those people who are now saying cultural Christianity is important actually believe Christian doctrine. And I think it's probably true that there are many people who I meet who would say, yeah, I get that. You know, Christian morals are important, that Christian worldview shaped our democracy and what have you. But, oh, gee, uh, you know, can we believe the Bible? Mm. I mean, um, you know, hasn't it been disproven? Isn't it full of inaccuracies? How can we know mm -hmm. uh, that it has any authority or that it's even the same scriptures that they had in times mm. gone by? Mm. So I guess that's the first yeah. question. Yeah. What would your response well, be to that? It's an important question. Well, I, I want to first of all say before kind of coming to the questions around the Bible is that, that I think even Alex O'Connor, you know, mm. as a well-known YouTube atheist, he's recognising as I have, that, that new atheism is a spent phenomenon, that, that effectively it sort of overplayed its hand and, and actually it didn't provide the kind of answers people needed. And so I think even if you're, you've got a lot of these kind of secular intellectuals who aren't, who, who definitely haven't become orthodox Christians, they're nevertheless, they're not, they're no longer really atheists anymore. And that's the difference. They're, a lot of them are describing themselves as something like lapsed atheists. They're saying, actually, I, I, I can't kind of, subscribe any longer to this kind of purely materialist view of reality that, that a lot of people want something that they're, they're talking about transcendence they're you know again jordan peterson i'm not sure where he is you know when it comes to christian faith specifically but he's not an atheist he's not you know he's 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 someone who who has something more than that and, and wants at the to, very least yeah. he's saying it's really important yeah absolutely for every one of us individually yeah. to think this through yeah 
Absolutely. And, and so that's the first thing I want to say. And I'm glad in the sense just that there's been that kind of movement. Okay. Yeah. If, if people are starting to just question their worldview, whether they can make sense of who they are, the morality they believe in, whether that makes sense on a purely atheistic worldview. I think, I think that's part of the process. So I think, I think a lot of people are on a spectrum. You've, and I think there are some people who, who, as Alex says, are sort of um, talking about Christianity in, in terms of its utility, yeah. uh, its value yeah, in yeah. culture. Mm. It's perhaps a useful fiction, you mm. know, and that might be someone like a, a Jonathan Haidt, maybe, might, might say, I absolutely uh, confirm the, the value of religion and the way, but I, I, couldn't, I can't believe it, you know, it's not something. I think there are people a bit further along on the spectrum, someone like, say, Tom Holland, um, who absolutely has written his thesis on the way Christianity has shaped the Western world, but also finds himself very attracted to it at a personal aesthetic level. Um, he does go to church. He, he goes to the oldest church in London, St. Bartholomew the Great. And in my last public conversation with him, actually talked quite candidly about some really interesting spiritual experiences that he's had. And so I, I don't exactly how, how he described himself at this point, but certainly he, he feels like he's on the edge of something. And, and I frequently feel the same about Jordan Peterson as well. And then you have got people who who have said, actually, no, I'm, I'm diving in. I, th I think I'm in on this. And that's people like Ion Hersey Alley. It's many other people that I talk about in, in my book and my podcast series who, who have actually realized, actually, you kind of have to make a choice at some point. You, you can't stay on the fence forever. And they may not have fully, I suppose, thought through every detail of the Christian faith. They, they may have questions about the Bible and so on. But all they know is it's it's a story that makes better sense of the world and their life than the atheist story of reality that, that they had been subscribed to before. So yeah, absolutely, questions remain about the Bible, um, about how can we trust it? What about some of the violent passages in the Old Testament? These are things that Alex brings up quite frequently when I have conversations with him. And I just think at the end of the day, we just need to become better readers of scripture. And too often I think, Christians have sometimes been boxed in by new atheists like Dawkins who want them to, to take a very sort of almost fundamentalist view of scripture itself and, and to sort of, and, and then it's easy to beat them with a stick and say, look, look, look at the early chapters of Genesis. Can't you see this is an anti-scientific book? Well, maybe let's just take a more nuanced reading of scripture and ask, well, what, what are those early chapters of Genesis trying to tell us about the world and about God and so on? And, and I find that very quickly you'll find actually that the Bible makes an awful lot of sense. Now, it doesn't mean that everything is, is sewn up and tidy, but especially with someone like Alex and Dawkins, when I find them particularly critiquing, say, the Old Testament, and it's some of, some of the moral stuff you find in there, some of the warfare, violence, and so on, I, I do want to point out to them, the reason you find this disturbing is because you live in a Christian culture. It's, it's the very morality the Bible gave you with which you now criticize those parts of the Old Testament that you find troublesome. So it's, it's a sort of, for me, you can't get away from the, the Christian element of the way in which we just engage everything in the Western world. It, it's there in the background the whole time. And this, it, fascinatingly, I, again, on my podcast series that accompanies the book, I, I interviewed a fascinating um, convert from communist China, a woman called Jenny. And she said, as she was going through her journey to faith, um, having come from a sort of atheist background in China and, and then discovering Christianity when she moved to the UK, she said she started watching some of these debates that Dawkins was involved in. And she felt like shouting at him and saying, the only reason, Richard Dawkins, you can critique this God of the Old Testament in these debates is because you come from a Christian culture. That God that you're sort of berating there would have been perfectly acceptable in my culture, a God who squashes people, who, you know, uh, does what he wants, uh, who's, you know, your, your, your critique of power and everything else. She said, he can only make these arguments against God because he's essentially a very Christian atheist. And I just found that fascinating that someone, if you like, who's not been steeped in Western culture yeah. can see from the outside that there's, these are very Christian critiques, if you like, of the Old Testament. And so I've, I've been, I, I think there are good answers. I think there are, you know, lots of reasons why I think we need to look at the Bible and the trajectory that it has in terms of its attitude to, to slavery, warfare, violence, and so on. But in the end, 
we can't get away by the fact that we've simply been shaped by the Bible. We, we are just products of the, the Christian revolution. And, and for me, that, that itself is, is a really significant thing. The slavery one always interests me because people say the Bible, we had a former prime minister in Australia who proclaimed his own Christian faith who argued that slavery was a normal and accepted uh, you know, thing in ancient times uh, and that the Bible endorses it. In reality, it was in this very country, the greatest human rights movement of all times, the ending of the African slave trade, was initiated by Christians, mm. essentially because in the words of the Wedgwood uh, um, uh, cast plate, mm. the, you know, am I not a man and a brother? Yeah. There was a recognition that came out of the New Testament that um, in the eyes of God, all souls are equal. Yeah. Uh, and so that just reinforces the point that you're making. Yeah. Uh, and, and I would say, you know, just very quickly on, on this point, it's a huge one, but as you said, slavery was just a de facto part of culture and economy in Greco-Roman times and, and had been, and frankly still is in some parts of the world. And in that sense, what you what Christendom did was incredibly countercultural. Mm. where as slavery started to become a thing of the past in medieval Europe, and obviously its new manifestation in the new world, then obviously was the, 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 the abolition movement was bed, led, as you say, by Christians. It's, it's, it really hasn't happened anywhere else. You know, historians like Rodney Stark will say, mm. Exactly. The, it's hard to imagine anything but the Christian mm. church mm. leading to this point where very unusually now in the Western world, there- I don't think you could point to anywhere in history yeah. where anyone other than Christians has really sought to set uh, slaves it, free. Exactly. I'm and open to correction, but I'm not aware of it. I, I, I would agree with that. And, and the point being that obviously what you have in the Bible in the Old and New Testament, I would say is, is a trajectory, if you like. Um, now, you don't get any explicit denunciation of slavery per se in the New Testament, but you do have things that radically undermine the whole institution. That's my point. Yeah. And, yep. and so you get... All souls equal in the eyes of heaven. Yeah. Uh, oh, the slave that I'm keeping in the eyes of a greater being is of equal value to me, even though I might be a very wealthy slave owner or the king absolutely. himself. Yeah. And, and I think... It's Somebody it, says it, we're not more important yeah. than someone else. Yeah. And, and it's, it's helpful being. to kind of put yourselves in, in the cultural position there. It's, slavery was just such a completely, you know, integral part of, of life and culture there that the idea that, that, that Paul and the early church would simply kind of overturn that in one fell swoop is it, kind of historically naive. And so they were obviously working within a culture that, where this existed, but they were, they were doing things which radically changed the relationship, mm -hmm. as you say, between slave and master. They, you know, when Paul says in Galatians, um, now you're all one in Christ, slave or free, yep. Jew or Greek, male or female. That was extraordinarily countercultural. Um, it is today again, by the way, too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. Likewise, you know, even when he's giving his household codes in Ephesians, where and this is often what the critics pick up, you know, it says slaves obey your masters and so on. It's actually in the context of him also saying masters, be kind to your slaves, treat them well, for they are your brothers in Christ. Again. That's pretty that radical. Is, that is absolutely radical. The idea that they were basically on level ground. Now he acknowledges this system still exists. This is kind of, but we're going to do it differently because we're going to call each other. And when he, you know, sends um, sends the, the runaway slave back to Philemon, it's as a brother in Christ. It's it's saying this that this is kind of what I see as the trajectory towards emancipation mm -hmm. in the Bible. And you can't ignore that. You can't just sort of cherry pick verses and say, no. oh, well, it's, it's actually the Bible is a story about God's revelation to humans, hard hearted humans. And for me, the abolition was kind of the obvious end result of that in, in the end. The point that I uh, strikes me that's important for us to ponder for a moment here in this time of extraordinary change is that essentially much of the understandings that have slowly arisen in Western culture out of the full implications of Christianity, equality of all, dignity, worth, fairness, justice, dividing line between good and evil is not one, between one human and another. It's within each of us. Mm. It's taken years to reach the point where we enjoyed great freedoms and opportunities to flourish, in my view. Mm. It appears that it's collapsing. You know, 
centuries of slow building a better world and suddenly mm. we're undermining it mm. in a couple of mm. decades, mm. which is why this debate's so important for people. You know, it's not going well. You only have to look around. Mm. What does this mean? Now, let's come to another thing, of course. I'd just be welcome. I'd be interested in your views on this. Another blocker to faith, suffering. How can a loving God allow this suffering? Mm. Um, the reality is that we inflict an enormous amount of suffering on one another because we're not who we ought to be. But it's a real problem for many people. Mm. How can a loving God allow suffering? Yeah, it's a huge one. And I won't do it justice within the context of this conversation. But the, the place I sometimes want to begin for someone who, I suppose, has an intellectual objection to God when it comes to suffering is to say, the very fact you recognise that we live in a world where this is wrong, that, that there's a kind of a, a sense of, of good and evil, right and wrong, that suffering is a bad and evil, if you like, is itself for me a pointer to God. We, we, we can't really talk about justice and injustice and those sorts of things unless there's some kind of moral lawgiver that kind of grounds our very ideas of justice. I mean, this was actually the argument in many ways that led C.S. Lewis to to at least believing in God initially was the, the fact that he said, you know, I had this complaint against God that the universe was so unjust, yet where had I got this idea of just and unjust? You know, how can a, a man um, call a line crooked or straight unless he has some idea of what a straight line is? And, and the point being, if you believe that the universe, that, that the world is not the way it should be, mm. if there is a God, then you, you have a concept of justice and right and wrong. And the question is, how can you even have that concept if actually all that really exists is matter in motion, the blind forces of nature? So there's a kind of philosophical bit of work I'd want to do to start with at an intellectual level to say, can we even talk about right and wrong, good and evil in the absence of God? But then at, at the much more experiential, emotional level, I think I, I would want to say, yeah, it's, it's a huge question. It's a huge mystery. And again, the, the problem is, by simply denying God, deleting God from the equation, you don't solve the problem. No, it just becomes meaningless. Yeah. You, you, instead of In it which being case, a, why do we feel hurt by it? Yeah, it, 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 it stops being a mystery. It just becomes meaningless. There's no mm. rhyme or reason to any of it. And I don't think ultimately, if, if, you, if what you're interested in is helping people get through suffering and evil, simply saying, well, there's no God isn't necessary. I mean, that was the, the, when the Atheist Bus Campaign said, you know, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Well, it's probably not going to help the, the crack, um, you know, addict or the, the, the widow in Darfur just taking away God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. It's, well, actually, that might have been the only thing that gave me some hope in this world. And, and so I want to just simply question the whole idea that sort of just sort of eliminating God mm. sort of just suddenly clean, cleans the whole thing up. I don't think it does. Why, if there is a God, why does he allow suffering? Again, a huge question. I would, I would just simply say that we have an incredibly limited perspective as human beings. We cannot see the big picture. A very simple illustration I've used of this. It's, it's insufficient, but it's, it kind of helps in some ways, I think. When, when we had um, our um, second youngest son, Jeremy, he was born and he was born with a skin infection. And uh, that meant that within less than 24 hours, I, I had to be in the sort of ICU unit at the hospital, helping a doctor to kind of find a vein in his tiny little wrist to, to insert some antibiotics. And then I was tasked with just feeding him these little drops of sugary water to try and keep him calm. And obviously it was, it was a horrible, painful process, but I wished I could have said to him, we're not doing this to hurt you. We're not doing this to, you know, make your life a misery. We want to help you. This suffering that you're enduring is, is actually ultimately for your good. And I think in a, again, it, it, in a much bigger way, we are like the baby who just cannot understand its place in the universe. We cannot see what those bigger purposes may be that we simply have no idea of when it comes to God. So that, that doesn't often help people when they're in the midst of their suffering. But it, I think there is a sense in which we just have to with some humility, except that we cannot see what God may see in the bigger picture when it comes to the, the suffering and evil we see in the world and the way in which God may use things even in all kinds of unexpected ways for, for bigger purposes. 
the only, the, but the real answer I would give to, to say a grieving mother, someone who is in the midst of suffering, is, is a diff, I wouldn't want to give them a sort of philosophical sort of theodicy in that way. I would just want to say, God knows what you, how you're feeling, because that's at the heart of the Christian faith. It's the idea that a God came in to experience suffering, who was beaten, crushed, humiliated, rejected. Um, and at the very center of the Christian faith is a God who went to the cross and experienced all of the suffering and brutality that the world could throw at him. And so that may not answer the problem of suffering and evil, but it certainly gives an incredible amount of hope to many people who are going through suffering and evil, that they that there is a God who is with them in the midst of it. And for me, that's, that's often the only thing I can point people to is, is the hope that there is a God who, who understands. Well, that brings us to the resurrection. Mm. Uh, which surely is the central cataclysmic moment in the Christian scriptures. The idea that he not only identified with that suffering, no one could have been more unjustly treated, no one could have felt lonely, lonelier, no one could have known greater mental and spiritual anguish, no one could have known greater physical pain. Anything we experience pales into insignificance beside what we put him through, that's mm. what we're told. He does it so that he can then take the punishment for our wrongdoing. Uh, and it's not enough though to say that he simply identifies with it and took the punishment. The extraordinary claim is that he rose from the dead. Mm. Now many people have a problem with miracles, but that's the biggest one of all. Mm. The resurrection. Yeah. Isn't it such an extraordinary miracle that no sane person could believe it? <laughs> no. Even well, I believe it, but I can understand I, genuinely why people really balk at it. Absolutely. And, and I think the reason a lot of the time is because we've been raised in a culture which essentially says, well, of course, dead people don't come back. Um, and, and you can understand that. You know, we, we've lived in a culture for a long time, which is the undercurrent of which has been this scientific materialism, you know, that, that all that exists in the end is matter in motion, the laws of the universe. And so we we cannot accept something like a resurrection. But I suppose I would just simply want to, to encourage people to say, well, what if we've got the story wrong? What if actually that, that view of scientific materialism is itself an unwarranted assumption about the world? What if actually there is more in heaven and earth than can be contained in your philosophy? What if actually, if there were to be a resurrection, Jesus perhaps was the supreme candidate for whom it might happen, because from what I can tell, he predicted it himself. Uh, it was predicted in the Old Testament. Um, and from that, that one weekend in Jerusalem 2000 years ago, we are still living in the wake of it and, and the extraordinary social transformation it generated. Something, something happened 2000 years ago. Now you may say, well, it can't be a resurrection, but something happened. The first followers claimed at the expense of their own lives, comfort and safety, that Jesus Christ had been crucified and raised from the dead. I think there are lots of, if you can simply open your mind to the possibility <laughs> that there may be a God and that miracles maybe might happen, this strikes me as the most plausible miracle in the world. Because for me, historically speaking, it just makes sense of so much of the data. Um, I, I'm not expecting sort of everyone to be convinced, but I, I look at some of those facts around what happened uh, that Easter weekend. And you've got to ask yourself, firstly, you've got the fact that Jesus was crucified. That's just a, and died by Roman crucifixion. That's just a given historically. There's really no con controversy around that fact. Then you've got the fact that a group of his women followers claimed to have discovered an empty tomb. Again, that's interesting because a woman's testimony was worth far less than that of a man in that culture. If, if this had been a put up job, it's very unlikely that the writers of the gospels would have made women the first discoverers of the tomb. That, that would have gone against all of their sort of aims if they were trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. And yet, if that's how it did happen, that's what they reported. You've got the fact that, again, historically speaking, all of the historians of the era um, agree, whether they're Christian or not, that people claim that they had met the resurrected Christ, that you have these stories of, of Peter and, um, and James and 
and pull. And so again, you may not think, maybe you, you can come up with a different theory. Maybe they, they had some kind of hallucination or vision or whatever, but there were, people claim to have met the risen Jesus. That is a kind of historically given fact. And then you've got the way in which it completely transformed the lives of these followers. And they went from being these fearful people behind closed doors to suddenly boldly proclaiming that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, had risen from the dead. As I say, undergoing persecution, beating, and death for, for it. And, and frankly, it, it was a very weird, surprising thing to say in the context of Judaism at the time. They, they believed in a general resurrection at the end of time, but this idea of the Jewish Messiah coming back to life, that was not part of the script. So what made these good God-fearing Jewish people suddenly start talking about and, and, and being willing to risk their lives for this very strange theological claim? unless it's what happened. And so I just think there's lots of pieces of evidence that you can put together at a, just at a purely historical level to say it's pointing towards something and the claim was that Jesus had come back to life. I find that that's enough for me. I don't, I don't think you have to throw your brain in the bin to, to say actually this makes sense. I think actually once you've kind of opened your mind to the possibility that there might be a God, the resurrection actually I think flows quite naturally. I can't help observing that I think the great majority of us still have a sense that life doesn't end with physical death. Mm. So that, in a sense, plays into this story. We don't think it ends for us yeah. when we breathe our last. And Some do, but most, I suspect, don't. And, and death, despite all our efforts, it still is that sort of final enemy, isn't it? It's still the thing we spend an awful lot of time and money and resource trying to put off for as long as possible. And if we were just the product of a purely material, naturalistic universe, that's an odd thing that we're so keen to avoid death. Mm. It, feels, it feels a bit like it's still this intruder in the world. It's still something that seems to go against the grain. So when I think of Jesus and the fact that he conquered what the New Testament calls the, the last enemy, death, it rings true of human experience that it makes sense of of our soul at that level. I think we all want there to be more. Well, again, trying to trying to walk in the shoes of people who might be listening to this and to sympathetically say that, well, for many of them, the Christianity's teachings or the church's teachings, however they might see it, on things like sexual ethics, gender identity, somehow seem cruel mm -hmm. uh, and denying of my right to choose my identity. I think that's quite a problem for a lot mm. of people now. Mm. Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because we're living in the wake of the, the sexual revolution, the 1960s. And, and with that has come, for a lot of people, I think they, they sense that this is a new era of freedom and you know the ability to choose for myself, who I sleep with, how I identify and everything else. The, the irony is that there's a wonderful thinker, I'm, I'm sure you've come across her, um, Louise Perry, whose mm. book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, has also pointed out all the ways in which the sexual revolution has actually not been great for people, especially women and children, that there's a lot of things about the loosening, if you like, of the, the Christian ethic on monogamy and marriage and so on has done to actually really uh, infect culture with, with a kind of this is attitude to, to, to relationships that, that's actually very negative for people um, because the the kind of where that ends up with is is tinder and with pornography you know that is just floating around the internet for everyone to see and with just these kind of very vapid unsatisfactory relationships so I'd want anyone who sort of feels that Christianity is somehow a straitjacket when it comes to its sexual ethics to say well what has the sexual revolution actually delivered us? You know, it's not all good in that sense. And you, and you have to take that seriously. Um, the other thing to say is that the sexual revolution of the 1960s was not the first sexual revolution. The first sexual revolution was the sexual revolution of the first century when, because Greco-Roman culture was, was a very permissive culture, you know, there were, now it was different. It was the, the sexual relationships were sort of more socioculturally and hierarchical in nature, but a Roman male could have sex with whoever he wanted, male or female, 
Um, th there was, in a sense, there, it was very liberal, you could say, but it was very bad for, for slaves and for women uh, and for children. Um, and it was Christians who, when they said, actually, we are going to constrain male sexuality, they changed the world when they did that, when they said, actually, it's really important that a man has one wife and is not able to simply divorce her just like that and uh, has to be faithful to her and is not going to be able to sleep with the scullery maid or whoever uh, at his whim. That was a revolution. And it, it was one of the hardest things, I think, that the Christian church had to do then. It then became so part of our culture that we kind of forgot just how revolutionary it was and the incredibly positive impact it had. And, but you, you, you see sociologists talking about this today, the way in which by kind of creating what is essentially the family unit, it, it was incredibly beneficial to culture. It stopped essentially um, in the sort of um, cultures where polygamy is rife, the kind of the resources that got wasted because of a lot of young men who weren't able to find, you know, wives and, and partners and so on because of the, 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 the situation. And, and there were just so many unexpected benefits to the Christian sexual ethic and the way it managed to create a flourishing culture economically, socially, uh, and so on. And so I, I just want to kind of point people to the fact that you may have in your mind this idea of Christianity as this repressive Victorian era, you know, stopping us having any fun sexually. But actually, it's the opposite. Christianity helped people to flourish with its sexual ethic. And so I think that should just inform the way people now look at it. Um, yeah, we live in a very progressive liberal culture where lots of people feel like I just need to be able to, free, to be free to do my own thing. But you look at the surveys, people aren't any more happy. In fact, they're far less um, satisfied with their sex lives today than they were in previous generations. And that should tell you something, that actually maybe there's something in this old fuddy-duddy Christian morality that should make us rethink whether just pushing on the freedom lever actually delivers the goods we think it will. Sometimes it's constraining our freedom that actually helps us to live more free lives. So that's, that's not a, a full answer to the whole question of LGBT and, and everything else. But I just think I'm hearing from more and more people who are just starting to question the whole underlying assumptions behind the sexual revolution that actually there are other ways of living your life that, as it turns out, can be quite beneficial for you, for culture, uh, and funnily enough, kind of are supported by traditional Christian ethical teaching on sexuality. I recently had the opportunity to speak in Australia to a group of between 50 and 60 young men and women, mostly university age, about half and half, I suppose. Uh, and the young men reported feeling enormously challenged and constrained by this, the, the, the awareness that they had that somehow or other they were uh, constantly under the cloud of being seen as toxic simply because mm. they were masculine, that they were all potential abusers mm. and uh, serial uh, uh, bullies in a, in, in a sort of relational sense. And the girls were saying, particularly the ones that were at university, I found this very disturbing in Australia, that every time they turned around, they were being told by a lecturer or a tutor or by their friends that men are all predators. And what came out of it, the, the sort of Me Too mm. movement uh, gone mad, what came out of it really was a deep sense that it's really hard for young people today to know about how to go about being romantic and yep. setting up a relationship mm. and uh, uh, doing so with decency and dignity and Mm. All of this is, mm. to put it bluntly, been pretty bad yeah. for romance. Yeah. And, and, and that's pretty sad. It, it, and I think it's, it's, and I think we've done a terrible job, secular culture has done a terrible job of what we've presented to young people because we give them incredibly contradictory messages. On the one hand, we, you know, fill the internet with pornography of the most kind of extreme nature and kind of normalize this as kind of this is what sex is. And that's kind of that, sadly, that is what educates many, many of our young people. And at the same time, we tell them, but if you 
you know, that there are these very strict rules about how you must engage the opposite sex. And it's, it's, there's just this massive mm. gulf between the two. And it's no wonder we end up with people who are incredibly mm. confused. And so I think, I think a lot of people actually, in a funny way, there is this sort of move, I've seen it among some parts of the younger generation, towards a kind of, a kind of actually going back to a more kind of traditional ethic in a funny way. There's, there's, there's a certain number of young people who, who kind of want to go back to chivalry and to mm. sort of actually just changing the rules about how we engage mm. with, with other people. And, and I think mm. I'm just absolutely sick of the kind of mm. sex saturated culture that we live in. Here's an irony for you in my, in my country now, our television screens every night are saturated uh, with um, government funded advertisements advising on the new laws around consent. Mm. Uh, and now I'm not saying that's not a serious issue, but it is an extreme irony, that I'm older than you, mm. that in the 60s, the cry was, get government out of the bedroom. Mm. The state has no place mm. in the bedroom. Mm. Mm. The state is back in the bedroom like yeah. never yeah. before. Mm. And maybe that's an illustration of what happens when freedom is confused with yeah. license. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and frameworks, disciplines, traditions yeah. are all just thrown away. And suddenly, what you actually end up with is a constricting environment where the state's telling you how to yeah. conduct your personal yeah. relationships. But the problem is that you know, I'm all in favour of consent and it's a deeply Christian idea. The problem is if that's your only kind of benchmark for sexual relationships, consent is it. And as long as you've got consent, you can do what you like, basically. That's a very thin version of what a flourishing sexual mm. culture and relationship is like, because you've taken one single sliver from the Christian revolution and you've essentially ignored everything else, which is about faithfulness. It's about long suffering. It's about, you know, pouring self-sacrifice you know Commitment. all of those aspects of what christian marriage is ultimately about have kind of they've been sidelined and we're just going to stick mm -hmm. with the consent thing and that yeah that's a good thing but it's it, that itself is not going to give you a, a flourishing happy sexual culture in our society and so for me i i just the problem the problem is that the reason we have to sort of litigate these things now is because we've forgotten the Christian story that ultimately gave people a kind of an internal sense of coherence around sexuality and relationships and that kind of thing. And, and I think, again, I think it's one of these areas where people are ready to hear a better story again. People are ready to actually not, and it's not gonna be a simple thing because we live in an incredibly confused, divided culture on these issues, but I think there is an openness now to, to saying, there must be a better way of doing it than this. And I, I feel like the Christian story is ready and waiting to say, actually, hey, turns out, some people did some thinking about this a while ago, and, and it did make an extraordinary difference to the world. Coming back to Alex uh, uh, O'Connor, you had a discussion where he suggested, it's an interesting uh, thought, that um, uh, there are good and bad reasons for coming to faith, and that a disdain for the way society is going or a concern uh, about the way it's going is not a good reason. Um, but I would have thought that in many ways, going right back to our earlier comments, many of the atheists would say was a good 9-11, mm. you know, was a mm. good reason, reacting against yeah. the world yeah. as they saw it, was a good reason mm. to become an atheist. Why is it necessarily a bad thing to come to faith? Because you look at the cultural mess around you and decide there must be something better. Yeah. Well, I'm very sympathetic to that. Now, I think in the end, there are, there are all kinds of reasons people come to faith. Mm. And it, you can say, well, this is a good reason and that's a bad reason. I think God's not quite so picky about why people <laughs> come to faith. I, I think in God's grace, there are all kinds of roots in, and some of them may be you know, wonderful roots and others may be terrible roots. You know, I know plenty of people who became Christians because they fancied that girl in the youth group. And that's not a great moral reason to come to faith, but it's you know, I, if God, God got them that way and, and, you know, he draws straight with crooked lines, you know, there's, so I, I personally though, I'm, I'm less worried than someone like Alex O'Connor about the people who are sort of looking at the culture and saying, this isn't working. Maybe we need to try this Christian thing again, because actually I think that makes perfect sense. I think a lot of the reasons why people ultimately believe and practice faith are not necessarily for purely logical, evidential, I looked at, you know, three arguments for the resurrection and four argument, philosophical arguments for God and came to this sort of 
intellectual conclusion. We're, we're a whole mixture of reasons. Now, for some people, and I've met plenty of them in my line of work, that intellectual journey is really important. And, and I suspect it will be for someone like Alex O'Connor if he, if he were to ever embrace faith. But at the same time, I meet a lot of people for whom it's actually, absolutely, there's, it's a gut level thing. There's a kind of experiential element to this. They look at the culture and they say, hmm, this isn't working. And they, they perhaps see a good example of a Christian or a Christian community. And they say, there's something about that that's attractive. And I think that's fine. I think that's absolutely the way in which the Bible and Jesus tells us to, to show our faith primarily. It's not through clever arguments, it's through the witness of a, a community that loves each other, that, that lives by a different script. So for me, I don't see a problem with that. You know, if some of these secular intellectuals are, are opening up to Christianity because they feel like the secular material world is just not delivering on its promises, I say, well, why not? You know, we should expect that. Um, if that's where they stay, then that might be a problem. I, and that, I agree with that critique. If, if, if it's only ever treated as that sort of useful fiction, well, we need to get back to Christian principles, but we don't want the Christianity that undergirds it, then, then I think you're onto a, you know, that, that's not going to work. It's, it, it'll just become another sort of politically useful idol. I don't think you can have the fruits without the roots. This came up in you know, your conversation with Ian Hersey Ali at the art conference, where she described Western civilization as a cut flower. We're still seeing the flower, the fruits, if you like, but it's been cut off at the roots. It no longer has the Christian story that once fed it. And so I think we'll only have those benefits if we can somehow connect again with the truth of the Christian story. Those wonderful benefits we all enjoy in Western culture of democracy, human rights, equality, dignity, compassion, progress, freedom, they only happened because people genuinely believed in a God of compassion and freedom and dignity. If you don't believe in that God, then it's going to be very difficult to get anyone else to believe in these ideas. So I think that's why I genuinely believe there's a way in which we could see the Christian story come back again in our culture because a lot of people are questioning this. There's lots of other potential routes we could go now. You've got big players like Putin and China and fundamentalist Islam and you know all kinds of other ideologies that exist in our culture. They're all vying for people's attention. They're all possible ways in which we could decide to live our lives. A lot of people feel like our commitment to human rights, democracy, equality and progress needs to be clung on to. The question is how? How do you do that? And I can't see how we do that in the absence of actually embracing the Christian story again. And I just feel like there's lots of these thinkers who are just saying, maybe, maybe we need to take the dive. Maybe we need to step into this story again. Well, uh, Neil Ferguson, Ayan Hersey Ali's husband, is you know, well and truly on the record for saying, acknowledging the critical role that Christianity played in the building of the West and its freedoms, its democracy, its prosperity. Uh, he has clearly indicated that in his view, the loss of Christianity is leading to the decline of the West. And now his wife, Anne Hosiali, mm. is saying only a revival mm. can really save the West. Mm. What does a revival look like? That's a big question. Well, I think the whole history of Christendom is, in a sense, a series of death and rebirth, of revival of different kinds over the centuries. And the faith of one generation, I think, quickly calcifies and becomes a sort of nominal cultural Christianity. But then you you have a, a Wesley or a Whitfield, or a Wesley or a Whitfield, or, or or the Victorian revival, or whatever it is, to come and suddenly breathe new life into a nation or into a culture. And the revi so revivals take many different forms. There are there are sort of much more local forms, you know, the the Welsh revival, mm -hmm. the Hebridean revival. But there are kind of general cultural revivals that happen as well. And, and in a sense, I would say the Christian revolution was the first and prime example of that. It, it absolutely transformed the Western and Eastern worlds to, to a large degree. I think whatever this is, whatever moment we're in, I'm, I'm loath yet to call it a revival. Because for me, that, that's something that suggests actually a real change of heart. People genuinely coming back to God and coming to faith. But I think, I think we're at the turning of that tide where a revival, yeah, of some kind could be on the cards. It might look quite different to the picture we have of revival historically in our mind, because I think this is a, a revival that's obviously going to use 
the tools of our culture today, YouTube, podcasts, um, social media. But I see hints that it's happening. I see, I see hints that there is this hunger happening. You're seeing it in some of these public intellectuals making very warm noises about Christianity. You're seeing it in some really interesting high profile people like Ayan Hirst Yali, um, Russell Brand and others suddenly having these quite dramatic conversions to Christianity and suddenly turning their huge audiences onto the fact that there might be something to investigate here. And then what we mentioned earlier, I think there is rumblings in Gen Z. There's a kind of dissatisfaction with what they've been handed by their culture. And I just wonder if all of these things together, and whoever knows what other geopolitical things might, might turn up in the mix, might be the kind of conditions under which, yeah, something like a revival happens in the West. I think it'll be messy. And I think you only ever often see these things in hindsight. You can only really see what was what was true revival and what wasn't in hindsight. But I just feel like we're due for something. It feels like the winds changed, the, the tides turned. And yeah, so my, my hope and prayer is that, that any person who calls himself a Christian would would lean into that and be hopeful and prayerful mm. that we would see our culture potentially transformed, even perhaps within our generation, who knows? So to complete the circle, to go back to where we began, uh, we're keen, I think for both of us, this would be true, that people do stop and say, I need to think this through. This is important. Uh, I'm not in a good place. The culture I live in is not in a good place. There must be better answers. But as you just yourself said, uh, this is a different world. Much of it's very impersonal. Mm. Whereas in fact, our needs, I would argue, are deeply relational mm -hmm. uh, and Christianity is deeply relational. What advice would you give to people listening to this conversation if they stayed with us this long, uh, you know, in an age when most of them have no contact with the church, many of them won't mm. particularly know people who believe, where do they start? Any useful well, hints, any specifically, practical I think, suggestions? I think a lot of people watching or, or listening to this conversation are probably the kind of people who have bumped into some of the characters we've talked about already and have started to maybe wonder, well, maybe that story of naturalistic atheism I got sold wasn't, wasn't the full story of reality. But I think that the difficulty is what happens next, that, that maybe they think of themselves as a lapsed atheist but how do you make the jump yeah. if there is a jump to be made? I don't think you can do it purely by listening to more podcasts and watching more YouTube videos. That, it's wonderful that, that we've got all of this stuff mm. at our fingertips, but it's, it's exactly what you said. It Some, is great. There's a, there's a real yeah, upside to social absolutely, media. Absolutely, absolutely. It's like all yeah. technology, it's yeah. morally neutral, can be used for terrible purposes yeah. or great purposes. Absolutely. So, but so, it's not enough. But it's not enough. Um, and that's where I'd say, we need each other. We do need community. And that is essentially what the church is. It, mm. It's a community of people. And it's difficult because as soon as you start interacting with other people face to face, you quickly learn all of your own frailties and problems and all of theirs as well. But we've got to do that. We've got to take the leap and actually talk to each other again, get, get in front of each other. And the, the point of the church is that it acknowledges that it's we live in a broken world and this the church is full of broken people but it's precisely because of that that we can gather around someone who is far bigger than any of us we don't gather around a, a political ideology we, we don't gather around simply a good set of moral teachings we gather around a person who through his life death and resurrection showed us a completely new way of living in the world that has transformed the world and we've forgotten the story, but actually I think people are just starting to hear the echoes of it again. And when you do that in community with other people, it has and can still transform the world. So if you want to take it to the next level, my only advice would be give it a try. First of all, pick up the Bible. It's basically the thing that informed the way you think today, whether you realize it or not. That's the book that gave you your, the sense of who you are But today. it's 66 books. 66 books. Where would they start? I would suggest starting in the New Testament. So not at the beginning. The, not at the beginning, not in Genesis. Though it's, a, it's a good read, but I would start with Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Just dive into the story of Jesus. A lot of people won't have heard of that. You said Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The yeah, four the, the, biographies. The four the biographies, the Gospels, yeah. um, the, the stories of Jesus. And, 
and just start to ask yourself, who was this person? Millions of people have done that down the ages and have been surprised to find a very compelling person waiting for them in the pages of scripture. So I would say start there. And then the next level to take it to is maybe just to walk into your local church and, and, and give it a try. Um, I can't guarantee exactly what you're going to find there. People are very different. But I think any I think God meets any genuine seeker. As they move towards God, God moves to embrace them. And for me, I'd say give it a try. If if everything else you've tried hasn't worked, maybe take a leaf out of Ion's book. Give this a try. It it made all the difference for her. It could make the, all the difference for you. But take it to that next level. Don't just stay at the level of listening to interesting thinkers on podcasts. That's wonderful for a season, but you only experience what Christianity truly is once you step inside that story and start to see, to test it, to put your weight on it. That's what faith is in, in the end. It's actually putting something to the test, putting some weight on an idea and seeing if it can hold up. And, and I found it has. You're a caring person. I thank you for it. And I'm sure there'll be many who will really pick up and appreciate your thoughtfulness and your integrity. Thank you for the opportunity for the conversation. Go, Will. Thank you.